The moment we have been waiting for for almost two years now has finally arrived. The U.S. will square off against El Tree in the finals of the Nations League. But despite the excitement, there seems to be other emotions in the air and they're not so great. Emotions. Emotions like fear. Emotions like doubt. Emotions like uncertainty. And that could be said for both the U.S. and Mexico. We're both kind of coming into this final a little bit hobbled. There's a lot to get into for this matchup, so we're going to break it all down in this edition of the Yank Report. What's up? My name is Sam. Welcome to the Yank Report, the show where we talk about the U.S. men's national team, U.S. soccer, the U.S. soccer universe. So if you're into that kind of thing and you're new here, please hit that subscribe button. We would love to see you again. And if you want to support the channel, the best way to do so is hit that like button. I appreciate everyone out there who hits the like button. Thank you very much. So USA versus Mexico, the Yanks versus El Tree, this young generation of American superstars that we've been waiting to see what they were going to look like whenever they finally get thrown into the fire versus this group of Mexicans who, you know, there's some young talent, there's some fresh faces, but there's also a lot of grizzled veterans. So it's going to be a really interesting matchup that everybody's been waiting for. But before we get into the American side, let's talk about the Mexican side. And as I said in the intro, it hasn't been great for the Mexicans in the last few months. They're not exactly coming into this game with a lot of momentum. In their last, let's see, four matches, uh, Mexico had, they lost to Wales in March. That's the same Wales side that the United States beat a few months ago. They beat Costa Rica one to nothing in March. Uh, they beat Iceland 2-1. to one. Now, it should be noted that this Iceland game, they were losing at halftime. They were really struggling to create in that game. It wasn't until uh, Irving Lozano and a couple of other players came on at about the 60th minute mark that things started to turn around. Now, it should be said that when Lozano hit the field, he hit the field like a burst of lightning and scored two goals pretty quickly. Uh, but it was kind of kind of shaky uh, for El Tri before that. And then in the last game against Costa Rica, they had a scoreless draw that went to penalties, and it wasn't until the final penalty that Mexico finally pulled away. And that, that Mexico versus Costa Rica game is a, kind of similar to what we saw from the United States versus Honduras. It was a game where Mexico was able to create chances. In fact, they had a tremendous chance where Irving Lozano proved once again that he's Mexican Superman, uh, kind of chested a ball and was like falling back Backwards and still managed to get a shot on target that was uh, saved by the keeper, but it was a fantastic chance from Lozano. But outside of that, there weren't a ton of clear-cut chances, although Mexico had the bulk of that. Uh, but it's not the Mexico that we're kind of used to, this Mexico that just dominates the game for long periods of time, dominates possession, and seems to just effortlessly create chances and just play beautiful flowing soccer. Now, part of that is probably due to the unfortunate injury to their star striker, Raul Jimenez. Jimenez was probably, not probably, he was the best striker in CONCACAF, uh, a fantastic player for uh, Wolves, but he had a head injury that was just really unfortunate, and he's been out for a long period of time ever since. Uh, really a devastating injury, a tragic thing to happen to any player, not something you wish upon anybody. But since that injury happened, Mexico's been struggling to fill that gap. Mexico is expected to come out in a 3-4-3. That's the formation they've been running for a while now. There's some speculation that the team wants to play a 4-3-3, but Tata Martino wants to play the 3-4-3. I don't know. I'm, I'm assuming that we're going to see the 3-4-3. Uh, the danger man, of course, for Mexico is going to be Chucky Lozano. He's been absolutely on fire the last few games that I've seen him play. There's also always a threat from Mexico from uh, the Mexican Messi himself, tactical manager's favorite player, Diego Linez. Uh, he's always a, a threat to make something happen. Now, once you get past the front line for Mexico, that's whenever you start to see a lot of their uh, their old guard and, and players that um, have been through a lot of wars and are going to be difficult to break down in this game. I mean, you got guys like Hector Herrera, who's one of, if not the best midfielder in all of CONCACAF. Uh, you got Guardado, you got Antuna, and then in that back line, you're going to, of course, have Edson Alvarez and Hector Moreno. Um, and then in goal, you're going to have Memo Ochoa. Uh, Memo Ochoa, who's getting up there in age at this point, but he has been the goalie for Mexico for as far back as I can remember. He came up big in that penalty shootout. So with this Mexican national team, uh, what they lack in maybe like the top, top, top end stars that the Americans have, they make up for in a lot of players, a, a lot of quality players, a lot of older players, players in their prime, players who have seen and done it all before, 
players who know what it's like to play in a final against the United States, players that know what it's like to win in a final against the United States, players that are going to keep their composure and are just going to give the U.S. hell for 90 minutes. Now, for the U.S. side of things, things get really interesting. Of course, you know, we've beaten to death at this point some of the uh, the tragedies of the last two games for the U.S. The U.S. has not looked great uh, so far in this, in this window, in the game against Switzerland as well as the game against Honduras. It's not quite the high-flying team that we were expecting. It's not the team, um, even in the games against Wales and Jamaica, you know, when we saw that our, our first team play, there was so much interchange, there was so much creativity happening, and all that interchange from the midfield created a lot of opportunities for Gio Reyna and Christian Pulisic to really run at the defense. We saw uh, Serginho Des have one of his best games in an American shirt. Uh, in that setup, it was free-flowing, it was really fun to watch, it created a lot of chances, and it created a ton of excitement heading into this tournament. But at this tournament, we haven't seen that. Uh, we've seen the team start with Jackson Ewell at the 6, and Ewell is just not a player who's going to be able to interchange as freely as some of those other guys. So he's pretty much been a static 6 the whole time, and that's meant that our Eights have been pressed forward. They've had a little bit of interchange with our uh, wingers, but it hasn't just it hasn't been that free flowing, fun team that um, I was really hoping to see in those friendlies uh, prior to the tournament. Now it must be said that a big factor in all of this is the loss of Tyler Adams right before this tournament. If Tyler Adams is in this team, you probably see a lot more of that interchange, and you probably don't see some of these uh, defensive lapses that we're seeing. Tyler Adams is also one of the um, most soccer intelligent and just all around intelligent players in the entire pool. And he's a, he's a player that keeps his composure and a player that can be a field general on your team. He's that leadership that we've been missing this whole time. So if Tyler Adams is in this team, it's probably a different team, but unfortunately he's not. And it doesn't look like he's going to be starting for this Mexico game. So because of all that, there was rumors now that Greg Berhalter might be changing the whole thing up. It was uh, Roger Gonzalez of CBS put a tweet out saying, that Berhalter is now considering um, a 3-4-3 for this game against Mexico. Now, I didn't think that that was going to happen because in all the interviews and pressers he did before the tournament, whenever people asked him about whether or not he was going to play a three-man back line against Mexico, he said he doesn't like the idea of two three-man back lines going up against each other because it limits space. Uh, so he was more into the idea of playing a 4-3-3 against Mexico, but maybe that was before the news of the uh, Tyler Adams injury, and maybe that was before he saw um, what Jack what he's going to get out of Jackson Ewell in this tournament, which isn't quite uh, the the deep line playmaker passer capable of pinging balls over the all over the field that we were led to believe that he could be. So since news broke that we could be seeing a 3-4-3 for this upcoming game, U.S. Men's National Team Twitter has just been all abuzz with excitement now. The big fear that people have going into this is that that three-man back line could potentially consist of John Brooks, Mark McKenzie, and Tim Ream. Uh, we know that Tim Ream is a veteran player that uh, – Greg Berhalter likes. He likes him in the three-man back line because of his distribution. He's one of the better passing center backs that we have outside of John Brooks. Now, I would push back on that. I would say, remember, in the Honduras game, the last substitution that uh, Greg Berhalter made was he took out Christian Pulisic and he brought on Matt Miazga. Matt Miazga became a right center back in a three-man back line. John Brooks was in the middle and Mark McKenzie was on the left. So I'm hoping that that was a precursor to what we could potentially see against Mexico. Now, what to look for in this actual game? You know, in that first game that we played in this window against Switzerland, we got to see the the U.S.'s team full press. And we got to see that on full display because Switzerland uh, built from the back for much of the game. In our second game against Honduras, we didn't see that press at all. And that was due to Honduras uh, choosing not to build from the back. They pretty much just played long ball all game and their game plan was really just to hit us on the counter, which was easy to do in that second half because we kept just giving the ball away for no apparent reason at all. Now, in this game against Mexico, you know and I know that Mexico is going to try to build from the back. They're going to try to possess the ball. They're going to try to hold, keep possession for long periods of time. They're going to ping it back from one center back to the other center back, from one center back to the other center back, while the crowd goes, ole, 
ole, ole. And we just get irritated for periods of time. That's that's how Mexico plays. That's how Mexico has always played. That's how they're going to play tomorrow. So we are definitely going to see that press in action. And the scary thing is that if we do press them, that means we're going to be vulnerable to balls over the top. And we've already seen what happens in this tournament if a team plays balls over the top against us. The hope is that if we play a three-man back line, that we're going to have a little bit more cover against that, that those balls over the top are not going to be quite as dangerous and that we'll have protection to deal with that. And that's the scary thing about potentially going with this three-man back line in the final is that this is not something that we've seen a ton of. We did play it against Northern Ireland, uh, but that was that was with our B team kind of with this a team roster we really haven't seen it so we don't really know what it's going to look like we don't know what the cracks are we haven't had um, a ton of games to, to really kind of work it out but at the same time if we do go with the three man back line that means we're bringing on hopefully Matt Miazga but it might be also be Tim Ream which are two players that are some of the more experienced players in the team I know Matt Miazga in particular is a fan favorite because of his moment with Diego Linez last time that he played remember he did the now infamous I'm um, a lot taller than you thing uh, so you know that Matt Miazga is game and ready to play against Mexico and knows what that's all about now of course I could be completely wrong and we p could be going with that 4-3-3 I hope that if we do go with the 4-3-3 Jackson Ewell is not our six I hope it's Kellen Acosta Acosta will give us a lot more range and he'll give us a lot more physicality we saw in the end of that Honduras game whenever he came on he ran over a couple of Honduran players immediately he brings that physicality he brings that ability to tackle he brings that ability to whenever we are in possession he can interchange he knows how to play the eight so he can kind of go back and forth and we can bring back some of that free flowingness so what are my expectations Expectations going to this game. Let's first of all let's talk about the big picture of the U.S. men's national team, and I think that that is this the the, the Greg Berhalter discussion, and it's a discussion that's really heated up uh, in this window uh, because it's been a project this U.S. men's national team for the last two years, and and because of COVID, we haven't seen this team play for a long time. Uh, so we've been hearing Greg talk about you know building a system and and being able to. Uh, bring guys in that, that know what they're doing, know what's going to be asked of them. So we were expecting to see a product on the field that was really cohesive. But so far in this tournament, we really haven't seen it. Uh, instead, we've seen a team that completely lacks cohesion and a team that at times has been at each other's throats because they're not where they're expecting each other to be, which is a scary thing considering that's the whole point of the system is, is so that those types of things don't happen. So this game against Mexico is going to be a huge game for Greg Berhalter about where he sits in the fan base because, you know, there are fans that have just never accepted him, hated the way that he uh, got the job, hated the way that the, the, the coaching search went and just decided it's never going to happen for them. There are fans that after that game against Mexico in 2019 in the Gold Cup, that was it for them whenever he used that game as basically a training session to show the team how to build from the back, even though it was clearly not working. They lost him right there. Now, this is another moment where I think the fan base is kind of waiting and saying like, OK, Greg, if now's the time, you got to show it to us. This is our biggest rivals. This is a final. This is a game that, you know. Maybe we don't have to win, but it's a game that we really want to look competent in. We want to see that all the stuff that you've been working on, that this team knows what it's doing, that, you know, Weston McKinney and Christian Pulisic and Gio Reyna are in a situation where they can thrive, where we're not seeing John Brooks being isolated, where we're seeing our players play to their strengths. So this is a big moment for, for Greg Berhalter in the eyes of the fan base. If the U.S. go out and just get embarrassed tomorrow... He's really going to lose a lot of the fan base. I don't think that anything will happen with the coaching situation. I don't think that U.S. soccer is going to fire Greg Berhalter or anything like that, no matter what happens tomorrow. The only way that U.S. soccer would fire Greg Berhalter is if World Cup qualifying gets put in jeopardy. So regardless of what happens, Greg is going to be our coach, at least until uh, September when we're World Cup qualifying starts. But if you want to have a happy fan base, if you want to have a tranquil, at least, you know, mildly tranquil U.S. soccer going into uh, World Cup qualifying, the way that we perform in this game is going to be very important. Now, how we're going to perform is going to be very interesting. Um, as far as my prediction, I'm thinking like a 2-1 situation, and I'm not 100% sure which team gets two and which team gets one. These are two teams that have both been struggling to find goals and create chances. Uh, now, the U.S. has had some chances in the last few games that they've created. It's just been about finishing. And the other thing is Christian Pulisic hasn't gotten a goal yet. Gio Reyna hasn't gotten a goal yet. Weston McKinney hasn't gotten a goal yet. Serginho Dest 
hasn't gotten a goal yet. These are four players for the U.S. who can just create something out of nothing at any point. We've seen Pulisic do it. We've seen Reyna do it. We've seen McKinney do it. Uh, so the U.S. has that on their side, where they have these all-world players who are fantastic dribblers and, and can just make something happen. Now, on the other side of the field, Mexico has a few of those as well. In Lainez, the Mexican Messi, and I just like saying that. I'm sorry. So both teams are fully capable of scoring on the other. It's just going to be a matter of who can do it over 90 minutes, who can hold their shape, who can be tactically disciplined over 90 minutes. So that's it for me, guys. I'm curious to know what you think. Are you as apprehensive and nervous and almost going to watch the game with one hand over one of your eyes the entire time? Uh, let me know what you think in the comment section. And as always, if you speak Spanish, please let, leave a comment in Spanish. I have a feeling I'm going to get a lot of comments in Spanish for this particular video. I know that there's a lot of Mexican fans out there that watch the channel. I I know that there's a lot of American fans who are also Mexican fans. I know there are a lot of Mexican fans that are also Americans. Uh, so if there's going to be a lot, you know, there's always a lot of turmoil whenever the U.S. and Mexico gets together. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching. If you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing so I can see you again. Uh, if you want to support the channel, if you like the video, if you found it interesting, funny, educational, whatever, please hit that like button. It helps out a lot. My name is Sam and this is The Yank Report.